tonight on Unsolved Mysteries. Jessica was 15, a cheerleader, and in some ways much too naive. She should never have accepted the ride that led to this, fleeing for her life in a lonely cemetery. Recently, a series of spectacular sightings had the entire state of Arizona buzzing about UFOs and visitors from beyond. The military said the strange lights were just flares, but eyewitnesses say it just isn't so. It was supposed to be a night to relax and have fun. Then a young Marine found himself surrounded by gangbangers with no way out. Perhaps one of our viewers can help track down the men who shattered Joffrey Ramos's life and dreams. The bizarre case of Rachel Timmerman began when she accused a man known to some as a town bully of raping her. Then Rachel and her young daughter Shannon abruptly disappeared, as did three other people. The common link? This man, the same man who allegedly raped Rachel Timmerman. Also a poignant and heartwarming reunion as a result of a phone call from one of our viewers. Join me. Perhaps you may be able to help solve a mystery. Madison County, Ohio, March 16th, 1991. A teenager runs for her life. She has to outrun her assailants. She scrambles over a fence and lands in a cemetery. A few hours earlier, her clothes were torn off. She was raped in a car and held hostage. Somehow she escaped. Now she hides behind tombstones. She tries to get out of the graveyard, but in the pitch black smashes into a fence post. The men catch up. They strike her face with a blunt object, and they leave her to die. Her name was Jessica Lynn Keen. She was only 15 years old. Later investigators are able to pinpoint Jessica's final movements based on clues in and around the crime scene. Mud on the fence a sock that belonged to her, an impression of her knee in the ground. But they didn't have a clue about why anyone would want to kill her. The gruesome murder of Jessica Lynn Keene has baffled local and state detectives for years. Jessica had been a popular cheerleader, an honor student, and a talented performer, and a young woman with goals and dreams. Jessica idealistically would have loved to have been a singer, an actress. I guess realistically, Jessica was loved animals and going wanting to go to college to be a zoologist. She was always laughing, always smiling, always singing, always fun to be around. Hey, Susie. Hey, Jen. Hey, Jen. How you two doing? What's up? <sighs> Not much. Sean's supposed to meet me here in a little bit. That year, Jessica's life began to have its ups and downs. It had to do with being a teenager. It had to do with rebellion. It had to do with meeting her first love, 18-year-old Sean Thompson. Hey, Sean. It wasn't an issue for Jessica or her mother that Sean was a different race, but it did bother her mother that Sean had had minor brushes with the law and that he was a high school dropout. I would forbid her to see Sean and said, you can't see him till your grades come up. But I was concerned. I, we discussed her, you know, as far as her going to college. She knew she'd have to keep a good grade average in order to get a scholarship. And uh, her grades started dropping. And she had skipped school a couple times to be with Sean. Jessica wanted to get away from her mom. She thought about running away, but she didn't actually know where to go. And she didn't want to be a runaway. And of course, she's threatening, you know, I don't want to live with you anymore. But I, I knew I had to do something. Arguments between Jessica and Rebecca escalated into fury. They desperately needed a cooling off period. 
Mother and daughter mutually decided that Jessica should spend two weeks at a local live-in counseling center for teenagers. Okay, I've got some questions I want to ask, too. Hi, Sean. What are you up to? On Friday, March 15th, the day before she was to move back home and just hours before she died, Jessica spoke to Sean. Jessica and Sean uh, ended up getting into an argument that day uh, on the telephone, at which point they broke up. Numerous people witnessed this telephone call Fine, and, and said that Jessica was very uh, visibly upset. Later, Jessica told a friend that she was going to the mall. She was last seen at a bus stop near the center at 6 p.m. Authorities suspect that Jessica was abducted. Yeah. Come on, hop in. We'll give you a ride. No, it's okay. Um, there is a chance that maybe it was somebody who Jessica kind of knew, maybe wasn't really good friends with, but familiar enough with them to trust them enough to get into the car. Thanks, guys. Not knowing what would ultimately happen. Jessica's body was found 42 hours later, 20 miles from the bus stop. It was noon on Sunday. Investigators sides. surmise that after Jessica was abducted, then, uh, she was held captive for at least six hours. Based on a semen sample, they believe she was raped two to four hours before she escaped from the car. This is the road here that uh, Jessica ran down after she was able to get out of the vehicle. I don't think she had any idea at the time that she was actually climbing into a cemetery to hide. But that was, at that point, that was her only uh, means for getting away from whoever was chasing her. This is the area where they, uh, the crime scene investigators found one of Jessica's socks. She obviously lost it while she was running. The sock that was found matched the one that remained on Jessica's foot. We do know that she hid behind this headstone. That was based on the crime scene investigators found her knee print in the soft ground behind the headstone. We are uh, pretty certain that Jessica saw the light on from the farmhouse, and that's what she turned to run for uh, when she collided with the fence post in the back of the cemetery. When she got back here, because it's so dark out here at night, she uh, was not able to see the fence back here and collided with this fence post. Once she collided with the fence post, she knocked herself down. And at that point, her assailants were able to catch up with her when this is the spot where she was ultimately killed. I've never been so passionate about anything that I've ever worked on in my life. The thought of this young girl, 15 years old, uh, who had such a bright future, uh, being murdered in such a horrible, horrible fashion, uh, you cannot help but want to do everything humanly possible to find out uh, who did this. Do you have any ID on her? Sheriffs in Madison County turned their attention to Jessica's boyfriend. But Sean Thompson wasn't in Columbus. He had left for Florida with some friends. They were ultimately returned to Ohio. Uh, Sean was questioned. Uh, the uh, friends that had gone with him were also questioned. And through the questioning, examination of physical evidence, we, we have all but eliminated uh, the boyfriend and the friends. DNA evidence from the semen sample did not match Sean or the others. The group was cleared of any wrongdoing. But an entire week had been lost. The trail of the actual killer or killers had grown cold. Jessica's death never stops haunting her mother. What they they did to her, um, the fear that Jessica felt. She would do anything to get away. I, I can feel her heartbeat running through the cemetery. I can feel um, the deep breathing she was probably doing when she knelt behind the tombstone. I can hear her praying. I realized that that was the worst thing that I believe anyone could go through. I, I pray.
pray to God to this, that when she hit that fence, it knocked her out. I'm not revengeful. God has the only right to take someone's life. But um, if someone does something usually and gets away with it, they'll do it again. I know that this is one of the last chances we'll really have to find out who did this. Next, when a peculiar V formation of light appears over Phoenix, many claim the Air National Guard is the cause, but those who actually see it feel very differently. Roswell, New Mexico, 1947. A mysterious explosion. Unidentified debris found in a remote pasture sparks a UFO frenzy. Official explanation. A downed weather balloon. Bentwaters Air Force Base, England, 1980. Multiple sightings of strange lights and aircraft. Official explanation, a meteor shower. Hudson Valley, New York, 1983 to 1989. Mysterious V-shaped formation seen by hundreds of local residents. Official explanation, an elaborate hoax. For UFO buffs, it's always the same story. An unprecedented event, followed by an official brush-off. Now some say it has happened again in Phoenix, Arizona. All right, you tell me what it is. March 13th, 1997, 10 p.m. Oh, what do we got? A man named Michael Kristen shot this videotape. Take a look at this. And before I noted, an entire display of lights comes on. Uh, got a little excited at that time, and I called my wife. Uh, it took her about a minute to get over there, and uh, uh, it was really quite unusual. Michael Kristen wasn't alone. This videotape was shot around the same time, 15 miles away. Look at the three of them all together. I got the third one popping over here. There's one behind the chimney. In fact, the bizarre lights were seen by thousands of Arizona residents that night. An unexplainable series of strange bright lights seen over the skies of Arizona gets a lot of people wondering what the heck they saw. Not surprisingly, an official explanation soon emerged from Captain Drew Sullins of the Air National Guard. The 104th Fighter Squadron of the Maryland Air National Guard's 175th Wing was conducting a night training exercise in the vicinity of the mysterious lights. And what they were doing was dropping uh, night illumination flares over the, uh, the North Tactical Range at Luke Air Force Base. And a lot of uh, people seem to think that those flares could, in fact, have been the quote unquote mysterious lights. Flares. It seemed perfectly plausible and was widely accepted. However, there was one little problem with the military explanation. They said they'd only drop flares between 9 and 10 p.m., but the most impressive sightings occurred earlier between 8 and 9 p.m. Taken together, these highly credible eyewitness accounts seem to indicate that there was something other than flares in the Arizona sky that night. Was it an extraordinary UFO event? Judge for yourself. 8.10 p.m., nearly an hour before the military would begin dropping flares, Ross Nickel and his family were on Highway 89, just outside Chino Valley, 90 miles north of Phoenix. I looked out the window, and I saw some lights in a very small pattern. And what they really looked like at that point was some just dim stars, several of them in a very tight pattern. Wow. Let me out, I got Hold, hold it. Let me, let me look at this first. They were white like stars when they were coming towards us. And at that point, they changed colors and went from white to red. They were just overhead at that point, and they were, in my estimation, not very high off the ground. I'm guessing 1,000 feet. And there was absolutely no sound during the whole time from the start to the finish. There was absolutely no sound. What is it? I have no idea. 
There was definitely five of them. It's moving again. They were basically on a flight pattern of some kind that was fairly uniform. Ten minutes later, 8.30 p.m., 90 miles south, a commercial airline pilot and his wife were driving home after dinner. For professional reasons, a pilot agreed to tell his story only if his identity was concealed. They don't look like fighters. That's a show formation. And I've been flying for 29 years now, and I'm not used to looking up in the sky and not being able to figure out what I'm seeing. I looked at it then and tried to make it into an airliner. I realized again, ah, it's going too slow. And oh, by the way, there's no noise at all. Definitely not fighters. And then the next thing that struck me is that, yeah, and why it, would his landing lights be pointed straight down? Because the lights appeared to be about five lights arrayed in this V formation with landing lights pointed straight down. Ross Nickel and his family had seen the lights here. The pilot and his wife saw them here. Whatever it was seemed to be on a definite southerly course. 14 miles southeast of the pilot's sighting, Osma Linderman and her boyfriend had their own peculiar encounter. Keep in mind, the military would not begin dropping flares for another half hour. What is that? It looks like it's going to crash. Wait. It was very clear in my mind that it was one solid craft. The lights were traveling too perfectly spaced apart, and there was a void clearly between the lights that blacked out the stars when it came down. Look at that. Wow. Where's it going? I don't know. The whole thing just slowed, I don't know, maybe to a stop or it hovered for a second, and then what looked like one solid red oval object, it just turned red and shot straight up and disappeared, gone, completely gone. You know, I tried everything I could to explain them away, and I said, well, it looks to me like a flock of geese flying down from Iowa with flashlights in their mouth. 8.45 p.m., still 15 minutes before the military would begin dropping flares, trucker Gary Moore saw the lights approximately 10 minutes after and 80 miles south of Osma Linderman. Hey, Jimmy, you see those lights over the east? And they didn't look like floodlights. They didn't really look like spotlights. There was something different about them that uh, I had never seen before. Between 8 and 9 p.m., the Phoenix lights had traveled over 300 miles and been seen by hundreds of witnesses. Gary Morris's encounter came near the end of the first wave of sightings. Like a flock of geese, uh... An hour passed. Then at 10 p.m., Michael Christen shot the videotape that would set off local hysteria and provide the basis for the official explanation. Approval, what have we got here? If you lived in Phoenix, these flares, some of them were dropped at 14 and 15,000 feet. They burn very bright. They burn for five to six minutes. They are suspended by a parachute, and it's a large flare. You would be able to see those uh, flares, I would imagine, for 150, maybe even 200 miles. The military says that flares like these, dropped at night, would look like this. Again, judge for yourself. I'm certain that the lights that I saw were not aerial flares, as used by the military. But I've seen them from the ground, I've seen them from the air, and these weren't flares. And probably the major reason that these were almost certainly not flares dropped by the military was they're, they're dangerous. So they would never, ever be dropped over a population center. We saw them travel over a distance of probably 70 to 80 miles over s about 12 to 13 minutes. And, and uh, no flares that I know can do that. The Ross Nickel sighting is very interesting because it involves... Veteran UFO family. investigator Richard Motzer has been on the Phoenix case since the beginning. Surprisingly, Motzer sides with the military up to a point. He agrees that the 10 o'clock event was indeed flares. However, he has no explanation for the earlier wave of sightings. The descriptions of the witnesses 
simply leave you shaking your head because they will tell you that this is no military vehicle that they have ever seen. And so right now, we can't make a determination on what actually happened at 8.30 on that night of March the 13th. Will the mystery of the Phoenix Lights ever be solved? For the military, the case is closed. But for hundreds of eyewitnesses, the question remains, did the Phoenix Lights come from somewhere beyond the stars? We've got to learn to accept certain things in life. Uh, we've been sending radio signals out in space for over 50 years now, trying to locate intelligent life. So why would it be hard for us to think that at some point in time, somebody finally answered the call? When we return, it was just a party, a chance to let off a little steam. But for Marine Corporal Joffrey Ramos, it became a terrifying descent into hell. A gangbanger. A flurry of gunshots. A man left for dead. But not a rival gang member. An innocent victim. He is 20-year-old Joffrey Ramos. Handsome, good-natured, a dedicated Marine who had recently made the rank of Lance Corporal. September 21st, 1996, Canoga Park, California. It was supposed to be innocent fun. Joffrey and some fellow Marines had been invited to a party. One more of that, come on. Hey guys, you made it. Hi. 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 What did you bring? I'm just some everybody's mind. This is Joffrey. The clean cut Marines mingled easily with a diverse mix of partygoers, which according to one of Joffrey's friends included some gangbangers. I want a rosebud. They didn't say nothing to us, you know. They didn't pay no mind to us, you know. They didn't start no trouble with us. We just. We did our thing and they did theirs, you know. Then, without warning. What do you think you were doing with Pablo? Hey, he came up to me. You wish. He's not that desperate. He is if he's with you, Trampita. <laughs> then that's when the whole fight broke out. Just everybody was fighting. <laughs> For Joffrey and his fellow Marines, it was time to go. This was a party, not a war zone. As they reached the Jeep, Joffrey remembered he had left his wallet in the backyard. His friends inadvertently drove off without him. They could not have guessed that Joffrey was heading straight into battle. On the street, destroying a Marine was considered a badge of courage. Your Marine! What's up, man? Let's get him, man. Come on, take him, Holmes. Nothing. Come on, man. Come on. We'll take Let's take this fool out, Holmes. Let's go. Come on, take him. The alleged ringleader of the group was a reputed gang member named Louis Quesada. What's up? You know how to kill a Marine? Yeah. Huh? Come on. We can show you. Take about five minutes, Holmes. Mess him up real bad, man. Put his ass in check. We can take him down, Holmes. You want some? Huh? Come on. It's a big time macho marine? Nah. What's up with that punk ass hair, fool? You're going down, man. Joffrey sized up the odds. There was only one way out. Hit! Let's get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! Get him! Come on! Hurry up! Get him! Come on! Get him! Come on! Get him! Come on! Joffrey Ramos never had a chance. He was kicked repeatedly. Pummeled over and over. The vicious attack lasted less than five minutes. Marine ain't so tough, huh? It was long enough for Joffrey's friends to return. They went inside to look for him. Rui Quesada, meanwhile, apparently assumed an approaching car was filled with Marines and took aim. By the grace of God, there was nobody hit and we very much could have had five additional people laying out there dead. I believe a neighbor or somebody was yelling, there's a dead kid in the street. So then um, we ran over there. Grab some ready. Blow them over, ready? One, three, go. Let's get this. You could say it was like a nightmare. Oh my God, Ramos. 
Ramos, I don't know, man. the way he looked, was bloody, his face was swollen. And he was just, he looked like, you know, he was breathing, but he looked like he was just dead, you know. This guy needs help, man. He's bleeding. In the midst of the commotion, the police mistakenly arrested the Marines. We're Marines, man. We did Our initial belief because of the injuries that Joffrey incurred in the beating was that he was going to die. And even though he hadn't died yet, we were handling it as if he had died, because it was that serious. It was awful just to see him laying there like that. I remember looking through these glass walls that they had in the room, and I could see him laying there. And he looked like a monster. His head was bandaged, and it had tubes coming out of his head. His eye was so swollen. It was, um, his face, oh, his whole face was swollen, his nose, his lip. And uh, I thought I was going to die. The right side of Joffrey's brain had been smashed to the left side of his skull. He underwent emergency brain surgery and spent three weeks in a coma. Doctors doubted he would make it. I was unconscious for a long time. <laughs> and um, when I came up, I, I didn't know anything. Yeah, there's some, um, now some things are coming, but some are still gone. Though Joffrey suffered some permanent brain damage, it is remarkable that he is even alive, much less functioning. He spent eight months learning like an infant, all that it takes to walk and talk. I think it's that it's very unfair that Joffrey has to go through life facing all of these challenges that he has now, while Louis Casada is out there having a good time and doesn't even have any idea of what he's done to Joffrey or any, you know, or any of us. Joffrey had high hopes of making the military a career, but instead had to accept an honorable discharge from the Marines. Now every labored step Joffrey takes is proof positive that he's undoing the damage inflicted upon him that terrible night. I'll think about this till I turn, so I, so I get old and everything, and I, I, I forget. I never remember why. I never answer why. Why would they do that? Why? Why would they just? The number of question. The number one question is why. Why would they? Why would they do that? Next, a young woman is found murdered, but her baby daughter is still missing. Have you seen Shannon Timmerman? August 7th, 1996, Cedar Springs, Michigan. 18-year-old Rachel Timmerman left a party with 43-year-old Marvin Gabrian and two other men. I want you out of the car. Though some considered Gabrian the town bully, he was friendly with Rachel's family. He was well aware that life had dealt Rachel a rough hand. She came from a broken home and had given birth to a daughter when she was just 17. Still, nothing could have prepared Rachel for what she said happened that night. Out of the car. Ain't no way, man. I'm not getting out of here. It's in the middle of nowhere. Get out of the car! Do it! Do it! Get! No, not you! What? No! Guys! Guys! Marvin! Rachel later told police that Gabriel beat her. Then he raped her, not once, but three times. After a six-month investigation, Marvin Gabriel was arrested, 
then released on bail two weeks later. That rape was so brutal, and it took a long time at the hospital, and, and the scarring, I don't think, would have ever went away. It got to where she didn't really hardly trust anybody unless she already knew them, because she didn't know who could hurt her again. The accusations of rape divided the tiny community of Cedar Springs. But in the months that followed, Rachel began to turn her life around. She had a daughter to raise, 18-month-old Shannon. Rachel got herself a job at a restaurant. She uh, had fun working with some of the other young kids there. I got the sense that Rachel wanted to do something with her life, that she saw opportunities out there that she wanted to pursue. The baby is really what changed it all. Her uh, focus was on the baby almost 99%. Um, it was just all for the good. She knew she was a beautiful lady, and, and she started wearing makeup every day after that rape um, to try to make herself feel pretty because there were mean things said that really hurt her. So everything was really, it was like a miracle. But as a date for Gabriel's preliminary hearing came closer, Rachel's family says she began to worry about having to testify. She had told me that he'd threatened her numerous times. She was a little scared to go to trial, but I had talked to her about it. I told her, it's OK, honey. I'll go with you. I'll help you, and we'll do it. It was actually horrible. She would have reoccurring nightmares. Um, she was totally convinced that this man would kill her. Then two days before the rape hearing. Out of here. Where are you going? Well, just out. There's some guy. You don't know him. OK, you're taking Shannon with you? Yeah, actually, he asked me to bring her with me. She came out to see me and told me that she had a dinner date with uh, some boy. She was going to take Shannon uh, with her and have dinner. She'd be home in a few hours. A few hours passed. Rachel and Shannon did not come home. The next morning, still no word. Later that day, less than 24 hours after Rachel disappeared, her father received a letter. This letter was from Rachel and uh, basically said that she was going on vacation. We didn't know what to make of it. We were worried that it was kind of a goofy thing to do, that it just didn't make sense. Here, you just got a job at, uh, at the restaurant. You're earning money. Why would you need to go on a vacation now? June 5th, we had a uh, pretrial hearing scheduled for Marvin Gabriel on the rape charge against Rachel Timmerman. And uh, on that date, Rachel failed to show up for that pretrial hearing. Authorities say rape cases without witnesses are extremely difficult to prosecute. The charges against Marvin Gabriel were dropped. Eleven days passed. Prosecutor Crystal Roach became more and more anxious. There was still no sign of Rachel or baby Shannon. Then Roach received a letter, signed by Rachel, and sent from Little Rock, Arkansas, more than 1,500 miles away. Dear Crystal Roach, Marvin Gabriel did not rape me. When he wouldn't have intercourse with me, I decided to teach him a lesson. A short time later, we made up, and I can't bear the thought of trying to lock up an innocent man. Thank you, Rachel Timmerman. I didn't believe it. It didn't make sense to me. And, and I got angry because she was very serious about pressing these charges. I was concerned that something had happened to her. That same day, yet another letter arrived at the home of Rachel's father, it, too, was postmarked Little Rock, Arkansas. Dear Dad, Shannon is doing great. She misses you guys, but she's adjusting to life out here really well. I don't know for sure yet. The letter that I'd received was reassuring. It said she was uh, OK. They, her and Shannon were fine. They had a method of earning money. They were getting by OK, and that they would be in touch with me later. More than two weeks went by without another word from Rachel and baby Shannon. Then on the morning of July 5th, the still waters of Oxford Lake outside Cedar Springs were disturbed by a gruesome discovery, the decomposed body of a young woman. It was Rachel Timmerman. She had been uh, 
wrapped in chains and with cement cinder blocks uh, padlocked to the chains and duct tape around the eyes and mouth and then placed into the lake. The autopsy revealed that uh, Rachel Timmerman did die as a result of uh, a drowning, that she had been placed in a lake alive. Police believe Rachel probably died shortly after she disappeared. But what happened to Shannon? Fearing that the little girl had met the same fate as her mother, authorities called in an underwater diving team to search Oxford Lake. But the search came up empty. 18-month-old Shannon could not be found. Authorities developed a theory. Whoever killed Rachel forced her to write the letters almost immediately after she was kidnapped, then mailed them after throwing her into the lake. One suspect immediately came to mind, the man who stood accused of raping Rachel, the man Rachel was to testify against just two days before she disappeared, a man named Marvin Gabriel. We decided to go over to Mr. Gabriel's residence. Mr. Gabriel was not there, but uh, cinder blocks were noticed that appeared to be the same as what was found uh, with uh, Rachel Timmerman when her body was recovered from Oxford Lake. Authorities now had evidence that was potentially crucial to their case, but they did not have Marvin Gabriel. He had fled Cedar Springs. And strangely, Gabriel wasn't the only one who couldn't be found. It seems to be anybody that uh, knows Marv and has any information that could be damaging to Marv um, comes up as a missing person. Missing person number one, Wayne Davis. Davis had been in the car the night Rachel was allegedly raped. He had agreed to testify against Gabriel. Davis was last seen just days after Gabriel was released from jail. Missing person number two, John Weeks. Weeks was an acquaintance of Gabriel's, who had asked Rachel out on a date a few weeks prior to her death. His name came up when we were attempting to identify the individual that might have picked Rachel up on June 3rd from the Timmerman residence. In our efforts to locate him, we've uh, come up against a stone wall and found out that he also was a missing person. No one has seen or heard from him since uh, about the second or third week of June 1997. Curiously, that was around the same time Rachel and Shannon disappeared. The FBI was called in. They learned that Gabriel had been using an alias, Robert Allen. Missing person number three. To no one's surprise, authorities discovered that the real Robert Allen had disappeared in 1995. October 1997, upstate New York. A major break in the case. FBI agents arrested Gabriel. He had been cashing social security checks payable to Robert Allen. Days later, Gabriel appeared at an identity hearing in New York. Initially, he denied he was Marvin Gabriel. He has yet to be charged for any crimes he might have committed in Michigan. And he hasn't said a word concerning the fate of baby Shannon. The hardest part is just not knowing where your granddaughter is. It's a, it's a hole in your heart that needs to be filled. We know she's out there somewhere. We just want to know where she is. We want her back. Shannon Timmerman, Wayne Davis, John Weeks, Robert Allen, all missing, all with a common link, Marvin Gabriel. Coincidence? Authorities believe it is highly unlikely. as my wedded husband. I take thee as my wedded husband. On a previous broadcast, we brought you the heartbreaking story of Margie Elizabeth Hamilton. In the spring of 1932, economic hardship forced 14-year-old Margie to marry a man nearly 50 years her senior. You may kiss the bride. 
The loveless union unexpectedly brought Margie a measure of joy when she gave birth to a baby boy, Benjamin Austin Baker. But her husband James did not share Margie's happiness. How can that be? Please, please. Behind her back, James put the child up for adoption. Even though 63 years have passed, Margie has never forgotten the son who was taken from her. Her daughter Lois hopes that time will not run out before Margie's last wish can come true. It would be so wonderful to be able to, you know, say, Mama, here's Spinny, here's your son. Within minutes of our broadcast, two viewers contacted our phone center to tell us that Benjamin Austin Baker once lived as a foster child in their home. The information he provided was enough for Lois Baker Lane to locate her long lost brother in Everton, Washington. Benjamin Baker entered the foster care system at 18 months old and grew up just outside of Atlanta, Georgia. He later became a salesman, married, and started a family. Sadly, Benny has spent his entire life believing that his real mother had cruelly abandoned him. Recently, Benny boarded a plane for Colorado Springs to find out the truth. Hello there. Hello there. After six decades of separation, mother and son finally embrace. Their shared anguish evaporating in an outpouring of love. It's a long time. <laughs> uh, yeah. <laughs> I wanted this day to happen for my mama. And I can't even put it into words how I feel. I just am, you know, I am just so happy that we finally found him. There. I had given up a long time ago that I'd ever see them. So it feels great. It's, uh, you know, it's something I never imagined would ever happen. The last oh, one wow. I got was this one. Yeah. Was, he was yeah. eight years old. Yeah. Well, I tried so many years to find him, but I prayed a lot that it would happen. I'm just glad that I got to see him, and he's well and happy, and that we can be together before my time comes. every mystery, there is someone somewhere who knows the truth. Perhaps it's you. Join me next time for Unsolved Mysteries 